to um, present and introduced by, uh, by Walter. And I'll talk about the rest of the agenda after the, the first two presentations. Paul. Okay. Um, so I'm really honored to introduce Walter's talk. Um, if you look at the technical aspect of the Newton, there are, I think, two people who count. There is Larry, who came yesterday, and there's Walter. Walter arrived at uh, Apple in 88 and left in 96 and spent most of his time, as he writes on the web page, in the Newton group. And he's responsible for the fact that your Newton did never last, lost any of your data. Your data was safe. He's responsible for a storage system with London Dyer doing the, the lower layers. He's also responsible for the scripting language of the Newton, which every application is written in, which is called Newton script, or sometimes Walter script, based on his name. So I'm very pleased to introduce him and listen to his talk. Now, of course, that was totally inaccurate because, you know, there's lots of other people who worked on me besides me. But, but it's still nice to hear. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just pretend that I did all that by myself. Landon, in particular, is really responsible for not losing your data because uh, I don't know how he did that, but he did an amazing job on the low-level storage. Okay, so today uh, I thought instead of, instead of yesterday's focus on the future of Newton, we would focus on the distant past of Newton. Um, and so I'm going to just give a, a history of the, the long and winding process by which we got from not having any idea what we were doing to actually shipping the first uh, message pad. And I have brought a suitcase full of junk from the storage container, so I'll be holding things up randomly during the talk. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be describing some of the thinking behind Newton technology. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is from the CES, is this right, or is it from the launch? from the platform launch. CBS. Okay, so this is from 1992, uh, and this is we, pr we printed these giant these giant posters telling you all about how fabulous Newton technology was, or in reality was Indeed. going to be. <laughs> uh, and this is also the first appearance of the Newton logo. This is before we had taken it upon ourselves to change the color of the apple. You know, Newton was actually the first product to make a single color apple, which was actually against That's guidelines at the time. Only, only, well, actually, you could make a black one. Only black or six color. But ours was yellow. Uh, so anyway, so going back in time to um, 19, 1988, uh, I, as a, as a uh, young graduate student, decided to get a summer job. And it turned out my office mate was Bruce Horn who uh, is a good office mate to have if you want a summer job at Apple. And he uh, gave, a, gave a call to his friend, Larry Kenyon, who said, I'm working on this cool project, and we sh could sure use some, some people for the summer. So send him on down. So I went down and, and uh, took a leave of absence at that, after that summer, and I'm still on the leave of absence. So I don't know if my grad school will take me back or not, but I, maybe I'll never find out. Um, so anyway, I showed up as uh, this is the only picture I could find. It's a little embarrassing. But um, as, a, as a much younger person, and uh, this is the, uh, the cap of wisdom, we called it. And uh, the theory being if you wore this, then it, was, it would you'd help you think. But uh, it didn't actually seem to work. Um, so when I joined at that point, the, uh, the team uh, was called Special Projects. And it already had the Newton code name for the thing that it was building. Uh, and it, it didn't know what it was yet, but it knew the code name. Uh, and I think that's because the original Apple logo had Isaac Newton on it, the really, the really old Apple logo. Um, and it was started by a guy named Steve Sackerman, who had worked on Mac hardware. Uh, and he had, just, he had just finished shipping the Mac 2 and so on. And he had, he had decided that, uh, that Apple was now becoming very boring because it was starting to ship these sort of rectangular gray plastic boxes. And uh, he had left HP because he didn't want to ship rectangular plastic boxes. So he decided that he would leave Apple. Uh, and Jean-Louis Gasset convinced him to stay by promising him that he could do whatever he wanted, basically. Uh, he could start a new team. He said, OK, I'm going to start a new team. I'm going to put them in an office building far away from main campus. 
and we're going to work on whatever we feel like we should be working on, and you're not going to bother us. And Jean-Louis said, OK. Uh, so he started this team called Special Projects way out on Bub Road, which you, if you're in Cupertino, you know is far away from the main campus. Sorry, who gave him the okay? Uh, Jean-Louis Gasset. He used to be the, the, the number two guy at the time. Uh, yeah, later. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. In fact, Steve Sackerman, um, when he left Apple later, he started uh, DE with Jean-Louis. And the, well, to add to that, the, the culture of Apple at the time was this notion of starting renegade groups to reinvent the next thing. That's how the Macintosh yeah. came about. It was very competitive to the Apple II, which was Apple's primary business. Um, yeah? What about top management and their view on the disruptive technologies? How, how did they look at this? Well, well, we'll, get to that. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> but at this point, I mean, Jean Louis was top management. I mean, he was pretty much the number two guy. So, um, so he was. It was essential to have his support because he basically just carved out a place. And as as uh, Steve Sackman used to say, he protected us from the corporate immune system, uh, <laughs> which would normally engulf you and draw you back into the the main uh, protoplasm and digest you. Right. So, uh, so he actually succeeded at that for quite a few years before we uh, almost got digested. Uh, anyway, so, so that's sort of the scene when, when I arrived. There were about, I, I was trying to figure out last night, and I think there were maybe eight or nine people on the team when I got there. Um, and they had all been recruited by Steve from, their, from, the, from the Mac team, mostly, uh, for their exploits. So Ernie Biernick was there because he wrote Color Quick Draw, and he's a fabulous uh, software genius. And, and uh, you know, Pete Foley was there because he was a hardware genius. Uh, Steve Capps was there for obvious reasons. And uh, so it was a very exciting team to join at the time, huge amounts of IQ compressed into one space. And uh, the thing was that because it was started by essentially a hardware guy, Steve is basically a hardware guy, when I arrived, um, it was basically a project where we, we understood a lot about the hardware that we wanted because we knew what was cool, but the software was not quite so clear. So let's, let's review Newton Hardware in 1989, which is the document that I could find in my storage container. Uh, so this is, ignore that great confidential thing. Um, this is yeah, confidence, confidence. or confide. It yeah. says confide. I am confiding it. <laughs> I am confiding it to you. It's a coffee stain. Um, so since you can't read that, I, uh, oops, I uh, pushed the wrong button. Yeah, 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 good, good. Don't push that button if you're getting a presentation. So it had uh, an electromagnetic digitizer. The, the thing that we knew about this computer was that it was pen-based. That was about all we knew about it, but that was like the core of the, of the idea. In fact, when I showed up for my interview, the, one of the questions was, uh, what, if I gave you a million dollars, what kind of thing would you want to work on? And I had just seen, you're going you're to think, Ronnie, that this is funny. I had just seen at CMU some guys from IBM had come, and they had demoed a pen-based interface uh, on the on the RS6000, is that the name of that yeah. old first risk machine? And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So having just seen that, I showed up at, at the special projects team and I said, well, yeah, I'd like to work on this thing I just saw. It's, this, it's like a pen-based thing. It's like you write on the screen. And I'm sure that they thought I, had, I, had, I was like some kind of shill or something, that somebody had <laughs> told me what to say to get a job in this team. But I swear, I had no idea what they were working on at the time. But uh, so it had this, this pen digitizer, which was electromagnetic at that point. It wasn't. Um, the cost-reduced thing like the, like the message pad has where you have to touch it. It was more like a tablet PC is today uh, where it works when you're hovering. <laughs> it, uh, it had a dual, dual 20 megahertz hobbits. Now, you have to understand that this is 1989. So this is like four times as much power as the most expensive Macintosh at the time, which was the, <laughs> the, you know, the 2X, I think. 2FX. 2, 2FX, was it? No. no. Yeah. Right on the bubble. Yeah, okay, so, so internally, the two FX was the most powerful, not released yet, and so this was way more powerful. So the Hobbit is itself uh, a long story. Uh, we're gonna do like a workshop time so you can look at some of this stuff that I have in my suitcase here, but 